Okay, it's 11.30, now we can begin. So, first of all, I'll just ask you all to note down this problem and think about it and if you can solve it, you know. So, yesterday, amongst other things, we derived the, you know, equation of this curve of J versus rho in the asymmetric exclusion process and we found that J was U minus V times rho times 1 minus rho and it had a very nice symmetric form. The symmetric form, of course, is also traceable to particle hole symmetry in this problem. And uh, uh, so that's very nice. But uh, in applications of the ASEP, one of them is, in fact, to things like molecular motors. And since you're, uh, in fact, having this very nice cause by Debashish Choudhury on molecular motors, he, uh, and in fact, suggested this problem for you all. He said that, you know, uh, Suppose instead of single particles which are moving on this lattice, so there's a lattice, you know, there's a track and lattice sites, but the objects are bigger. So they're sort of bigger. They occupy maybe three or two, two, two sites at a time, but they still move one unit at a time, okay? So now you don't have particle hole symmetry. It's sort of clear the holes jump by two units, whereas a particle jumps by one. I mean, moves by, uh, the particles move. So when a dimer moves by one unit, that's like the whole jumping two units, right? Think about it, yeah. So uh, uh, you don't have this symmetry anymore. So the J versus rho certainly will look different. Now, the question is, can you find what the new curve will be? I mean, or at least figure out whether it'll look like that or like that by some qualitative argument. But I uh, just point out that you can make a one-to-one -one mapping between configurations of this dimer problem and your old ASEP. Uh, there's a, you know, given a configuration. Whenever you have a dimer, you can shrink it to a single site, a single occupied site, and you'll have a smaller lattice, but you'll, you'll have the same number of particles. So something will happen, you know, and so you can figure out actually uh, what will happen here. So do it, yeah. I think he will need this uh, intuition from you when he talks about molecular motors again, but let's come back to our discussion about exclusion processes. Now, you know, I've been uh, trying to teach you all many, or tell you all about many techniques. Like when we started with the random walk, we did it through combinatorics, through this, through that, uh, some algebraic method than random flights. So it's good to know about techniques. But one of the main techniques, which is not a calculational technique, which is of great use in theoretical physics, is mapping. You can learn a lot by mapping your problem to another problem. If you've solved this problem, very good. So you'll know all about the new problem. And you, usually the new problem you map to has its own sets of intuitions and this and that, so you can use that backward. So mapping is actually very, very important. And today, part of the things that I'll do is just show you some mappings of the problems we've been discussing so that you can realize that they're useful in other contexts as well. So here's the first mapping. Mapping number one, if you want. Okay, so we'll map this problem onto an interface problem. We've already talked about, you know, integral delta rho going to H yesterday, but let's actually go back to the asymmetric exclusion process and map it to an interface. The mapping is very simple. So suppose you have uh, a particle, you will associate it with a link which points upward. Uh, upward meaning, sorry, along the plus uh, 45 degree direction and a hole you'll associate with the link pointing the other way. Now what are these links? These are links as parts of the interface that you will hope to build up and for instance here's an interface that I've just uh, done by hand. I mean I've just, so successive links are drawn, the next link is drawn from the, where the other link stopped. So this way you can build up an interface. It's a discrete interface, but it's a, it's a nice interface. And so suppose you had to map this configuration using this to particles. What you would say, here's a particle, here's another particle, 
this one is a hole, this two particles, three holes. Okay, sorry, I've not been able to do it right there, but there we are. So, so there's the mapping. And clearly, this is a one to one mapping. So, given the set of particles and holes, I can construct the interface. But the interesting thing to ask is what happens when a particle hops? So, the answer is the following. Uh, so, let's consider a particle hopping. So, this particle, let's say, moves there. Okay. So, what happens? Your new configuration becomes the old one. Everything is the same except this has become a hole and this has become a particle and so on. But a particle and a hole look like a link that was here, this one. Whole particle has become this. So, all the particle hole hop does is to change this small top of the hill and push it down. So, this. So, this hop results in this move. The counter hop will result in the counter move. Similarly, uh, yeah, so a backward hop here will raise this. So, each hill, local hill and local valley is capable of fluctuating. If you're in the middle of a hill, uh, in, if you're in the middle of this segment, this can't do anything, but that's like saying that there are a bunch of particles. The particles in the middle of a cluster can't move. Cluster edges, something can happen. That's like hills and valleys. So this is a model of interface motion. Because as you can see, by applying enough of these moves, the interface can fluctuate. So this is a model of a fluctuating interface. It actually has a name in the at least in the applied math literature, it's called the single step model. Okay. And of course, as you will see, you can see easily that the height anywhere, h at some point, well, when you have these uplinks, your height increases. Downlinks, your height decreases. So the height up to some point is just adding up the number of uplinks, subtracting the number of downlinks. So it's the total number of particles minus the total number of holes up to that point. So it's like the integral of the density fluctuation. Okay. One immediate consequence is the following. Okay, so let me ask about the height at site i plus r minus the height at site i whole at the same equal times squared average. For the interface, perhaps it's not so uh, you know, evident how this should behave. But in one minute, we will prove using this mapping, we'll get the answer for this. How do we do it? Well, so as I said, this height difference is equal to I, j equal to 1 to r. So think of these as, uh, let's give it a name, tau, let's say. These uh, variables are tau. So this is tau equal to 1. This is tau equal to minus 1. This, this was n equal to 1. This was n equal to 0. So clearly tau is equal to 2ni minus 1. So there's a formula that connects the two, but it's, yes. So yeah, periodic boundary conditions. Yes, important. Is tau? tau is a variable that tells you about the link. Tau equal to plus one will tell you the link is going this way. Tau equal to minus one will tell you it is going down. It's, it, it's a simple thing. I mean, if you want to have it, let, let's have it. So the height difference between the two will be the sum of, of the taus. because you add or subtract. So this squared will equal this squared average. So this is equal to sum over j and j prime of uh, tau j, tau j prime. But remember, we have product measure. We have proved product measure for the exclusion process. Therefore, this will factorize 
And so we have to separate out j equal to j prime from j not equal to j prime. So this is equal to, well, so let me carry on here. So this is equal to sum over j tau j equal to j prime will give me tau j squared plus sum over j not equal to j prime mm, uh, tau j tau j prime. But this will factorize and the expectation value of each tau is 0. It is 0 because I am assuming for the moment that I have as many uplinks as downlinks. So I am assuming that I have half filled. Why am I assuming that? That is because I want a flat interface. I do not want a tilted interface. It is a flat interface which can fluctuate but without tilt. You can add in tilt and take care of it but for simplicity let us not. In, so in the uh, assume summation tau equal to 1 to L. Uh, so uh, assume, uh, what should I say, uh, number of particles was n is equal to L by 2. That, that's all I have to say. So then this will give me 0 and this will give me 1 for each j. And when I add them up, I get R. So I've learned something about the interface fluctuations. It says that mean squared fluctuations between two sites which are separated at a distance r grow like r. So the RMS fluctuation goes as square root of r. This is a rigorous proof. Now, in general, in the literature on surface roughness, people talk about this RMS fluctuation and define a critical exponent, an exponent which tells you how rough is something. So they would uh, normally say that this should actually go like uh, R to the, in general, some chi. It's often called chi. Chi is the roughness exponent. So what we have shown is that in one dimension, this fluctuating interface has chi equal to half. Okay. Yeah. No, but there are as many ups as downs. Remember, n is equal to L by 2. Suppose all particles were there, like uh, we are having all particles at the side. No, uh, no, because you are finding it hard to picture. Let us picture the simple case. First. If these are as many up as down, then it is okay. If it is not, then what you have to do is you have to imagine a pe periodic boundary conditions, meaning the whole system is replicated there. So you have a surface which goes down and it goes down further and further. And these bunches are exactly the same. That, that is the way to imagine it. And then you might want to put in a mean slope and subtract and do whatever you want. But that is the way to think about it. Okay. But uh, let's uh, see. What about the asymmetric case? Well, can I make this mapping? Yes, I can. I still have particles and holes. So therefore, I can go to this. Can I make uh, this dynamical move? Yes, I can. That's allowed. And that translates into that. So then what's the difference? The difference is only in the rates. Here, it's more likely, let's say, that you take uh, uh, forward moves than backward. So this will correspond to this becoming that more likely than this becoming that. Right? So what it's saying is that it's more likely that a small hill will become a small valley than the reverse. So you, 
the effect of bias in the motion of the particles translates into this. So, overall if you have your interface, the values will be, I mean the whole interface will go down. Hmm? So, it is actually a growing interface. Look at it the other way. So, it is growing. So, you are now describing a moving growing interface, right? What is the rate of motion? Sorry? U minus V? No, there is also a blocking. Not everything is successful. So, we have to ask in one time step, one Monte Carlo step, since all of you do Monte Carlo, uh, how many steps will the whole thing move down? And uh, well, whatever that thing is, uh, you do not even bother with the number, but that is the definition of current. Right? In the particle problem, how many s moves do you take? Each one is one step. So, if you add up all, you will get the net displacement of the center of mass, right? which will tell you what the current is. So, that is the current. That will also tell you the shift of height. Therefore, the bodily movement of the interface, speed, bodily speed is given by the current in the SF. Okay, so that, that, that is fine. So, what I am saying is you can translate various things back and forth and uh, uh, benefit from that uh, mapping. You know. For instance, here is a concrete simple uh, illustration of what you can do. Okay, mapping number two. This is a deposition evaporation process, except we won't deposit and evaporate one particle, but two particles at a time. So here we are. We have a lattice. And uh, we have a process in which two particles can deposit if there are two successive sites that are empty. Are there any, anybody can see some sites empty? Sure, here they are. Let us say these two. So, at the next step from the gas above or whatever, two particles can fall in and this gets full. On the other hand, two particles can also detach. For instance, maybe these two will detach. So, this comes back to Sadik's observation a little while before the class started. The question was about bonding. You know, when things fall, like here, when we are talking about dimers, these are bonded. They are very, you cannot break these dimers. But here, when these fall, you know, it is not that this has fall, fallen with a strong bond here. Once they are in, it is like hydrogen falling into palladium. I mean, you can think about hydrogen. Now he's laughing. I, I'm very serious about it. <laughs> right. no, okay. This is, this is oh God. Okay. Okay. We'll keep away from those. Right. No hydrogen gas. In the gas, hydrogen is a molecule. Everybody knows. Hydrogen is a mol. I mean, exists in the molecular state. What does what does a molecule mean? It's two atoms which are bonded strongly. So that's why you have molecules. You have bunches of twos. Now, when it falls on palladium, palladium is a metal which has a special affinity for hydrogen. There it is, but now it is in the metal, it is sort of communal. I mean, the bonds are not so effective. I, I do not know how much they go. Let us say they are 0, in which case you have a bunch of hydrogen atoms. Now, uh, of course, there is some possibility that the hydrogen may, uh, in fact, go back to the gas, for instance, if the temperature is high. But then it will prefer to do it two at a time. I mean, because you go to into a state with binding energy. So, uh, so this is supposed to be a pic picture of such a process. So, things fall in. Once they, so anyway, to define the process, two particles at a time on nearest neighbor can occupy two empty neighbor neighboring sites, and uh, two uh, occupied adjacent sites can get empty. Now, this I claim maps onto the exclusion process. Can anybody see how? Okay, the first thing is in an exclusion process, something is conserved, right? What is conserved? 
I think we have to distribute microphones to everybody. <laughs> Number of particles, yes, right. Okay, correct. Here is anything conserved. The total number of sites is conserved, uh, granted, but uh, something more dynamical having to do with the particles. Parity. Sorry? Okay, this is a good point. That's right. Yeah, and along those same lines, let's just uh, think of a sub lattice decomposition, MA and MB. So divide your lattice into two sub lattices, A and B. Okay, call the total occupancy of A MA or NA if you like. NA, a, NA would be better. No? And uh, call the total occupancy the other one NB. Then it's clear that NA minus NB is conserved, which is very much like what you were saying. Because when you remove two, you remove one from the A sub lattice and one from the B. So this gives you an idea of what to do. Uh, so if this is to become like a number of particles, you have to switch this sign. So how can you switch the sign? So you, you postulate a rule that you map onto a new problem, which will turn out to be the exclusion process, by doing the following. On sub lattice A, if I have a particle in my problem here, I'll put a particle in the exclusion process. But on sub lattice B, if I have a hole here, I'll put a particle there. If I have a particle here, I'll put a hole there. Am I allowed to do that? Yes, nobody can stop me. I'm allowed, yeah, I can do it. So what, what's the good of it? Well, so let's just see. Uh, take this configuration itself with the red things in and see what happens to it when we do this mapping. So on the A sub lattice, we have a particle. B, we have a hole. Now this is empty, so it will stay empty. This is full, so it will become, uh, sorry, should become empty, no? I mean, so this becomes that, yeah. This is full. This is empty, and that is full. So here's a mapping of a configuration. Now, what does the move do? So let's say these two actually went back into the, so what will happen is that this will become empty and empty, right? So here we are. But this is on B sub lattice, so it will become full here. And on A, this will have become empty, so the rest is unaffected. So you see the effect is just that this has moved there. So it's hop. So an elementary deposition or evaporation drop here, there, is just a hop. Is it okay? No. Okay. Yes. What? Uh, okay. So what we are doing is that this is a configuration uh, huh. So here's a configuration in my new problem in deposition evaporation problem. That has mapped onto a configuration in exclusion process problem. Mapping, the mapping is the following. On sub lattice A, Ni will go into Ni in the deposition evaporation problem, and this is the exclusion process problem, goes into Ni. And uh, on uh, sub lattice B, Ni in the deposition evaporation problem goes into Ni bar. So a particle goes into a hole. And vice versa. So this is the definition of the mapping. 
under this mapping, any configuration I have in my deposition evaporation problem, I will be able to map onto the exclusion process. Agreed? I mean, because there is a you know definite rule. That is what I did here. I took this configuration in the deposition evaporation problem, and here is the exclusion. process and have mapped this configuration using these rules onto that. You can check it. Okay. That is one thing. So, configurations can be mapped. Second thing you need to do is to look at an elementary move in one language and see how it translates into an elementary move in the other language. So, that is what I was trying to do. So, uh, an elementary move like in the de deposition evaporation language will go into, so if this is on A and this is on B, this would have been particle hole and that would have gone into whole particle. So, particle would have moved. So, maybe I should uh, draw a column and maybe that will become clearer. Okay, I should have done it from the beginning. Oops, sorry. Uh, here is your uh, deposition evaporation problem, and here is the exclusion. So, here, so let us say this goes into this if this is A and this is B. Then, uh, in the exclusion process, this will go in, this will have translated into that, and this into sorry that because empties become full on the B sublets. Uh, on the other hand, if they had been on the uh, B and A sub lattice, this had been B and this had been A, this would have been what would it have been? Empty and full. Right? So this would have uh, translated into sorry what am I doing? No, no, no. This, this has evaporated, but this empty full has gone into full empty. So, here particle has moved right, here particle has moved left, but the particle has moved. Okay, so, this is all I wanted to say. Is, is this okay? So, as a homework, you can think about what if the exclusion process rates are asymmetric, what will that become here? You can think about it. But at least in the symmetric case, it is very clear. So, you know, so if somebody, if Debussy shows you, for instance, he is not here, so you can, you can pull a fast one on him. You know, you tell him, but what if the dimers evaporate and come back? Oh, no, but the, no, but those are dimers. That will not work. They have bonds. Take it back. Wipe out what I said. It, it will not work. This works only if you do not have bonds. But, uh, you know, so here you are. You can. Okay, next time you go to your experimental colleague's lab who is working on hydrogen and palladium, you, know, you tell him you can work out the autocorrelation functions, you know, and he will be quite impressed. So, okay, you know, so this is just to tell you this is of some use. So, so you see mappings are useful. Okay, I mean A, it gives you answers directly and B, it helps. One word about at least the two mappings that I have talked about. The mapping between the ASAP and the interface problem works only in one dimension. This works in all dimensions, provided your lattice is such that it has a sub lattice decomposition into A and B. On such lattices are called bipartite. Yeah. So, keep this in mind and this uh, you should try to figure out, you know, just sit with yourself and in two dimensions, why can't I construct a height model given a set of uh, uh, particle configurations, what would go wrong, etcetera, etcetera. So, just try to figure that out. I am asserting that this is true. Try to check it. Okay. Uh,
Good. Let's proceed. That is correct. No, no. So, no, but uh, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. So, we are, uh, uh, so this is true in an infinite system. Hmm. Um, and th th this also has to go to do with the fact that we have product measure. I mean, which is, you know, and if you as approach R going to L, you sense the finiteness and the corrections will come in to that. So, this is uh, true, strictly speaking. I mean, this exponent that I've talked about in an infinite system. So L is infinite to start with, and now you're asking height fluctuations between here and there. You know. By the way, as you all probably know from the work of Mandelbrot, you all all know about Mandelbrot, right? I mean, so Mandelbrot uh, you know, has at least reported in his book, I don't know whether he's the person to measure, in real mountain ranges, he has looked at height fluctuations. Take the Himalayas, I mean, take a photograph, proper, I mean, and uh, look at the mountain ranges, m measure the height fluctuations as a function of the separation. Ask for how these grow with separation. You have to do an averaging, obviously. So you average over the whole range. So your R might be like 10 meters, up to 100 meters, up to some two kilometers, but then the range is very long, so you can keep moving and average. And uh, what you find is indeed power law growths. The power is not half. I don't know what it is for the Himalayas. I mean, somebody may know. But uh, it's a power. Oh, there you are. It's not so different from half. But okay, this is not one dimension and so on, but all right. So uh, the fact of power law correlations in many things in nature is a, a fact of life. And uh, therefore, uh, you know, this is uh, actually pretty good. Um, there are probably even good experiments which measure the r roughness in a controlled way. Maybe Manas knows about some of these. KPZ roughness, who has measured? Paper, yeah, but paper burning has the following alternative uh, uh, thing that it's, it's a motion of an interface, but with pinning. It's a, people, some people claim that it's a pinned interface, in which case it is a little rougher than this. But uh, liquid crystal. Oh, really? Okay, so this I did not know. Okay, uh, if you can provide a reference to that, we will yeah. give it to the class tomorrow. Ah, this is the old Eden model, probably. Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so there are several examples of this in the lab. So this is not all just, you know, theory for the sake of theory. It's theory for the sake of experiment. Okay, let's uh, move along. We'll come back to some more mappings a little later. But uh, this is uh, at the level of the discrete model, and that is why I wanted to get, uh, discuss these mappings right here. Okay, so let's, uh, any questions? Something not clear? Why is it doesn't work in the ah, that, that you figure out. Okay, I'll give you a hint. I mean, if you wanted to define height, you would, the height difference between two places depends on the number of particles in between, no? I mean, between this and that, it depends on how many particles and holes there were. The order didn't matter, and that was all. But now, in two dimensions, you have a height here and a height there, so you take a path and you find one height difference. If you take another path, what's to guarantee that the height difference will be the same? Nothing will guarantee it, and therefore you can't define height in a unique way, at least not through this prescription. So that is the reason. In one dimension, there's only one way to connect two points. Okay. 
you could, uh, if you like, consider a very constrained particle model which will always preserve height differences in the full lattice. People have even done that, but that's a little artificial. We will not get to that. So, free movement of particles, whether biased or unbiased, and with exclusion will not do it. But have a little bit of skepticism for what you read. Usually it will be right. Once in a while you will find it is not right, you know. And uh, so, uh, good. Okay. All right. Now, uh, we were in the middle of a calculation yesterday. Shall we just carry on with that? This was a sort of what I called yesterday distraction. It is not a distraction. I hope you have learned something. But now we come to the remainder of the calculation and I will remind you what we were trying to do. We had, uh, okay, uh, so actually I am afraid because of these mappings which keep coming, the, this lecture will be a little, you know, here and there, but never mind. We will complete one segment at a time and then we will go back and this and that. Okay, so let us come back to the height description and I will just remind you that the most general uh, equation that we wrote for the height, this is in one dimension, I mean, but we will now quickly generalize to higher dimensions also for the height model, realizing that the higher dimensional version of the height model will not describe the higher dimensional version of the particle problem, but never mind. Uh, right now, let me just talk about it in one dimension and so then I have the equation for the evolution of the height dh by dt is equal to c dh by dx plus one half lambda dh by dx the whole squared plus d d2 h by dx squared plus noise. And uh, just to, to the way we had thought about it is that delta rho, the, did we call it delta rho? Delta n or delta rho? I forgot. Delta rho. So, this was like dh by dx, which is uh, not so bad because like even in our model where we had particles, we put in slopes. So, it is dh by dx, you know. So, it is, uh, you can make a correspondence even with the lattice model. Okay. So, what were these uh, things? So, uh, all right. So, I, I just need a white. This was the uh, kinematic wave speed. This was the nonlinear, nonlinearity. Uh, this has various interpretations in different problems, but it came from in the particle problem from diffusion, from diffusion there and what it uh, represents here is surface tension. I mean because the it, see w what does diffusion do? Fick's law tries to equalize densities. If we have equal densities, we have 0 delta rho. If we have 0 delta rho, we have a flat surface. Surface tension tries to uh, minimize surface area, in this case surface length and uh, it is an effect of surface tension from diffusion. Here in this language, it will be like surface tension and this is noise. Okay. All right, so th this was the problem we have to deal with and we, okay, I have left out one term which is a constant term. Is there a constant term? Yes, as we saw in the ASEP to this uh, mapping, the current of the ASEP corresponds to a bodily shift of the interface, but I am presuming that we have done that, I do not want to call it Galilean shift, we have done that boost, 
is boost the right word? Boost, no? I mean, people use that for shift of velocity, not, not of acceleration, right? Okay, so, so good. So, actually this interface is moving downward or upward, let us say downward. Uh, so, we have done a boost with that mean velocity V naught, which is uh, essentially equal to the current in the extrusion process. So, that, that we have done. The reason I want, do not want to use the word Galilean shift, because I want to reserve that for transverse movements. And in fact, by Galilean shift, we can eliminate this. Okay. All right, and then we began to study yesterday the effects of a you know the, a model in which there's no lambda either, which would describe not a growing interface, but a fluctuating interface. Where would you have fluctuating interfaces in real life? If you have two phases in coexistence, okay, they are separated by an interface that interface may be rough or it may not be rough. What is the definition of rough? Rough means mean squared uh, h minus h, h i minus h i plus r squared average growing with r. If that grows with r, we say we have a rough interface. If that does not grow with r, but is bounded, then we say we do not have, we have no roughness. Now, in real life, are interfaces rough or not? So, let us step back to model land for a minute, the two-dimensional Ising model. Uh, can somebody tell me? You all know, no? in the Ising model, there is a critical temperature, Tc, below which you have long-range order or you can have phases. So, suppose I have arranged boundary conditions in a 2D Ising model such that I have only positive spins on this edge and only negative spins on that edge. Okay. At high temperatures above Tc, this will be irrelevant in the bulk, you know, this sort of boundary condition. But at low temperatures, uh, below Tc, this has a profound effect because it will force one phase here and another phase there, and the phases will coexist in the sense that this will be the minus phase, this will be the plus phase, and they will have to be separated by an interface. So, here it is. Question, is this interface rough or not? Does anybody know? This has actually been studied, a well studied problem. Answer, it is rough. Second point, the dynamics of this interface is actually described by the model we are analyzing the Edwards-Wilkinson model as is. So, this is quite nice to know that this will apply to the interface of the uh, 2D Ising model. It is not, not hard to show also, but uh, I will not show it now. But if you want to read about it, read the work of Douglas Abraham and Paul Upton and others and they will have uh, shown this. Yes. Which mapping? Yeah. Sure, it can. So, uh, is that okay? It's That's okay. Many to one mapping. It's not many to one. It's one to one, but it's it, no. It's one to one for a given bond. Think about it. For a given bond, if A is on the left and B is on the right, you might get one answer. I mean, there is a certain mapping. If B is on the left and A is on the right, you will get another answer, but it is always only that other answer. For a given bond, it is unique. So, there is no, no, no problem. But uh, it is a good point. I mean, it is a source of some confusion and some food for thought, but please think about it. I am claiming it is one to one and uh, in this sense. This is why I said in order to, um, you know, the most straightforwardly is the symmetric case where all the hopping rates are equal that will map very nicely into this, but, but think about it. 
think also if you want about unequal deposition and evaporation rates and what uh, uh, surface model that will, I mean, what uh, exclusion process that will correspond to. And that's an interesting one. It corresponds to something that looks like that. I mean, in other words, uh, particles more likely to have, uh, you work it out. I, I don't want to get into that. Okay. Okay, but, uh, you know, with this small twist that it, you know, the exact move map, mapping of the move depends on whether it's an AB bond or BA, it is correct. All right, good. So, yeah, yeah. Well, you have to be careful. You have, it, uh, the answer depends on the dimension. If you have two dimensions, okay, and you have a binary fluid mixture, let's say, where you have uh, two phases, then the, uh, given that binary uh, is uh, sort of in the Ising universality class, certainly this should apply. No, so in three dimensions, the answer is that there's actually a roughening transition as a function of temperature. So if you have the temperature axis, and here's Tc, then there's a second temperature called Tr, below which the interface is not rough, and above which it is rough. So in this phase, uh, I presume much of what we say will apply in this, not phase, in, in this region. Remember, roughness of the interface does not uh, mean that there's a very fuzzy interface and you can't deal with it. Because remember, okay, so let's come back to the Ising model again. And when we said the interface is rough, what it means is that if you put in a line here and you measure a height here and a height there, and you look at this mean squared thing, it will grow with R but it grows only as r to the half. So over your system size, it will grow like square root of L, okay, whereas your system is as big as L. So the roughness does have an effect, of course, and it's, a, I hope, a measurable effect. But uh, in 3D, you would have to be in this region to, to see it, to see the effect. Here, the, there are fluctuations, but they're bounded. No, no, no. This is only for Edwards Wilkinson. I mean, okay, so KPZ, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to, but here I'm talking about equilibrium statistical mechanics of two phases in uh, coexistence. And because it is equilibrium, this is uh, Edwards Wilkinson. Now, so let's consider the Ising model. And we have done this. We have created this interface, suppose. You know. You can, as you know, in the Ising model, there is the HT plane. Here is TC. And there's a convention, by the way. You should know the color convention. When you have first order coexistence, you should always use green. Okay. Always. This is a well entrenched con convention instituted by Griffiths, Fisher, and Widom, who used to enforce it everywhere. And, and uh, the critical point is always red. Okay. So this is the way it is. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, what was I going to say? What was your question? Uh, yeah. So, so as I said, phase coexistence is possible only on the, along the green line, right? Because uh, here you have one phase or the other. Now, suppose you put on a suddenly, a mag you start with the system, so here, you suddenly put on a magnetic field. What will happen? You favor one phase over the other. So therefore, what do you think will happen? Well, so let's say you put on a field that's positive. This was the plus side, this was the minus side. You favor plus over minus. 
surely the final equilibrium state is majority plus. How will you achieve that dynamically? Well, the answer is that the interface will begin to move. So, if you have an Ising model in 2D and you suddenly put on a field, the interface will push. Now, there is a small caveat to this. This will be true at low enough temperature that the primary thing will be the interface motion because now that the field is on, you can even nucleate other centers there. And, uh, but, you know, at low enough temperatures, that's a slow process. The interface pushing will be quite fast. And this we know, I mean, you know, in magnets, you just put on a field and the interfaces move. Barkhausen noise, everything comes because but there's spinning and all, that's a complication, but this is what would happen. So, I, I don't know if this answers your question. So, this is the way to achieve KPZ, because this moving interface will certainly be a growing interface, and you can go to a lattice model and show that A, that this maps onto the uh, single step model, B, there are kinematic waves on this interface and all sorts of things, and see that KPZ applies. Okay, so this is one more place where KPZ should hold, will hold. Sorry? How do I calculate? Uh, T roughening, yeah. Uh, it's hard to do because in three dimensions, there's nothing that you can actually calculate, you know, analytically. Uh, of course, I mean, every two years, there's a paper that will appear that the three-dimensionalizing model has been solved, but so far, you know, it hasn't held up. But, uh, the, but we have fairly good estimates of TR. I don't remember the answer, as, even as a ratio of TR over TC, but uh, those are obtained largely by Monte Carlo simulations. So, it's possible to have, you know, uh, to do enough Monte Carlo, I mean, especially, you know, so, so there are these expert Monte Carlo people. Kurt Binder is one name that comes in mind, but uh, there, I'm sure there are others. Does anybody here work on roughening, roughening transition? In India, I don't know who does. Maybe Surajit Sengupta. I, I, I don't really know. But, uh, uh, you know, so, the, but uh, theoretically, these are obtained by, uh, mm, uh, Monte Carlo, experimentally, uh, I don't know the exact situation, but some scattering experiments will tell you something. Do you know anything on this? No. Okay. So, I, I, I don't know the situation. But um, if you are interested, actually, uh, there will be a wealth of literature on this, and you will be able to find out. You know, so, so, do look it up. Okay. Okay. Let, let, uh, let's proceed. Um, okay. So, this was an interlude as opposed to the D word, yeah, okay. Okay, good. Uh -huh. So, we were uh, about to say that, uh, so, so this was a good thing that we had this interlude because this gives us some extra motivation for doing what we are in the middle of doing, namely studying the edwards wilkinson problem. And what we did is we, okay, so this is the problem we want to solve. Given this stochastic partial differential equation, we know we can solve it because it's the first, I mean, it's a linear equation. And uh, the solution, we, the way we took uh, to go about it is to define the, I won't write down the definitions again, h of k and omega. And then we actually worked out, if I remember, the correlation function, did we? I think we did. H of k omega, H of minus k minus omega, prime prime. And found that this is eta k omega, eta minus k prime omega prime, which of course, we had separately noted as a delta function in k and k prime omega minus omega prime, but with a denominator which was i omega plus d k squared times minus i omega, perhaps with a prime, 
plus d k squared k, k prime squared. Okay. These denominators came very straightforwardly from here because this equation implied the simple linear equation for h uh, which was this. So, we solved and substituted. Now, we use the fact that this is a delta function. So, k and k prime and at least k squared and k prime squared are the same and we can uh, write this in the form we want. Okay. Now, I mean so we can simplify the denominator. So, note that this is a delta function 2 gamma times delta k minus k prime delta omega minus omega prime. Therefore, we can Fourier transform back to real space and find then that h of okay, yesterday I wrote x naught and x naught plus x as the two points. Let me just set x naught equal to 0. Is that all right? It is just that we have chosen the origin somewhere. Hmm? That is easier to write. So, h of uh, where am I? Huh. Space point 0, time point 0, h of x t is the inverse Fourier transform of if you want, I'll write it down once since 2 pi squared, no? Yeah. Integral d omega d, well, d omega d omega prime, I mean, so is it okay if I skip one, two steps? I think it is okay. You can fill them in. All right. So, so let me write it in the sort of rational, you know, form. I will skip one, one or two steps, one step actually. So, you can write this as 2 gamma over 2 pi squared integral d k d omega. So, if you want to put two integral signs, uh, e to the i k x plus omega t over the denominators multiplied out, which will give you omega squared plus d squared k to the 4. what happened to the other term? No, sorry, I left out something. E times e to the minus, I have not written it, but I suppose it is there. Was it there? Should be there, no? Oh, no, no, it is in, I have not yet done this, sorry. So, what am I doing? No, 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 I still have to do the integral uh, of, uh, no, just this, this is, this is perfect as is, sorry. But now, let us do the omega integration. Concentrate on omega, 1 over omega squared plus constant squared. What is the answer? You know this. You cover, I mean, okay. So, this is a, an easy integral to do. 1 over omega squared plus a constant squared, you can just do the integral. That is a you cover potential. I mean, so anyway, so the answer turns out to be, uh, so, that is an exponentially decaying function of uh, uh, the something squared. So, if, this is, if you write the remainder as gamma squared, it is e to the minus basically gamma times t. So, what is it? That gamma is e to the minus k d squared. So, this is integral 2 gamma, capital gamma here, uh, over 2 pi squared d integral uh, d k. Okay, we'll come back to the denominator here, but here on top we have e to the minus k squared dt. E to the i k x still remains. And what is the Yukawa form? E to the minus kappa r divided by r, right? I mean divided by, yeah. So in this case, this you inherit this k squared. Okay. Check this. It's easy to do. Contour. Sorry. Just a contour integration. Uh, con okay, contour integration. All right. Good. <laughs> okay. Good. Fine. Now, uh, 
But let us look at our favorite object, which is h 0 0 minus h of x t whole squared. Okay, so, that is easy to do because this is h squared plus h squared minus twice this. So, I put it, put it all together and you get integral, okay, where, where are we, 2 gamma by d, 1 over 2 pi squared integral d k, 1 minus e to the minus d k squared t. plus i k x divided by k squared. It is good that we have this 1 minus form, otherwise some things might appear to be diverging. Now, you will see that nothing diverges as such because you have a k squared in the denominator, but when you expand for small k, you will pull down a d k squared, one will cancel and this, this will be a, a good integration. So, now let us just check some special cases. If time is 0, t equals 0, meaning that we are looking at the surface roughness at equal times. Hmm? So, at that time, you will verify, okay, let us call this thing sigma squared. Sorry? Okay, perhaps 2 pi. I do not I'll believe whatever you say. I, 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 huh, from the uh, integration. Okay, thank you. I mean, I am not sure. Actually, I, 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 I just sort of, yeah, so good. Now, uh, so at time 0, what happens? Well, uh, check it. Okay, see, so, the, so the best thing is to look at the scaling properties here. I mean, that is simple to do. Suppose, okay, uh, first set, yeah, t time 0. So, you see, how do you do that? Well, define k x to be some new variable y, little y, and uh, transform d k and k squared into y's and see what extra thing you have to put to do that. When you do that, you will find that sigma, so, so you have an integral and something pulled out and what is important is what is pulled out. So, go through this exercise and you will find that sigma squared is proportional to, proportional to t to the half. Oh, sorry, uh, we have we have set t equal. So, proportional to x. Sigma proportional to x to the half, implying the roughness chi equal to half, roughness exponent equal to half. Verifying what we know anyway. But now we get some new information. Suppose, for instance, x equals zero. What is that? That what is the meaning of that? So, we have this fluctuating height profile and we have fixed x. So, this profile is fluctuating even at the same spot it is fluctuating. So, look at it at one time, <coughs> record it. After time t come back, record it. Look at this mean squared difference and average this. Okay, and this grows as sigma squared grows like t to the half, you will verify. So, sigma grows like t to the one quarter. Okay. Now, general definition. Just as we said that uh, sigma of r goes like r to the power chi, so we will say sigma of t grows like t to the power beta. So, this just defines that new exponents, I mean exponents chi and beta. So, this just said, this just says beta is a quarter. Right. In fact, now let us not put something equal to something and something equal to something else, let us put everything together. And it is clear that I have a simple scaling form. What does that mean? That means that sigma as a function of x and t is in fact, let me just write it and you will see that it is true. 
So, I assert th that this follows from here by doing the substitutions of the type I told you about. Okay, so, let me rub this out. So, it is as we saw it is x to the half. So, x x to the let me okay, let me write it as x to the chi in general. So, let me write again a general scaling form. So, we have already said that sigma uh, of x grows like x to the chi. Uh, sigma of t grows like t to the beta. Sigma of x and t in the same general way grows like x to the chi, some scaling function of, let me write it in the form, uh, t over x to the z. This is x. So, so what am I trying? What am I trying to say? That see, we are working things out for the Edwards-Wilkinson model. Very good. We'll get explicit answers in that case. But in a ge more general sense, for other sorts of uh, surfaces other than Edwards-Wilkinson, um, these numbers chi, beta, etc., may not be exactly the same, but the fact that this grows as a power is expected, the fact that this also grows as a power is expected and the third thing that we hope will happen and is, I mean is confirmed uh, all over the place is that the joint function x and t is actually essentially a function of one variable t over x to the z. This z in fact is the dynamical exponent that we discussed yesterday and we give it a particular meaning, the lifetime of a fluctuation. More generally, it is the relation between x and t. Okay, so, this is uh, the way it is. So, you remember delta x to the z give you the lifetime. So, it is dimensionally that way. Now, in order for this to be true and conform to these, we must have particular types of behavior of the function capital Y as a function of its argument. For instance, if we are to recover this, then it should be that when time is 0, we get just this. So, therefore, we conclude that capital Y of its argument little y goes to constant as y goes to 0. Because by doing that, we will recover this. By the same token, we also want to recover that when x goes to 0, we should recover that. So, okay, but x going to zero mean will mean that this argument little y becomes very large. Fine. So we now know it is pinned now that that behavior. So when little y is large, we should have no x dependence. But there is an x dependence. So whatever this is, it must conspire to cancel that x dependence. So therefore, uh, must have. So here we can write down must have. This is 1 and 2. Capital Y of Y. So, how should it behave in order to cancel this x to the chi? Well, so here is t over x to the z. So, let us tentatively at least put down a y. But the power is wrong. We will get on to x to the z. We want x to the chi. So, we will put chi by z then it will work. Okay, so, it will work means x will cancel out. But then there is a bonus. It predicts that substitute y. The, so, then in this case, just carrying on. Uh, so, what am I doing? I am substituting this there. So, what will I get? So, in this case, sigma of x is 0 and t will be just y to the chi by z times that x, x has cancelled out. So, we are left with t raised to chi by z, which is good. But we wanted, in fact, we had defined this, this should match with t to the beta. So, good, we have a now a relation between beta, chi and z. Beta is chi by z. So, let us confirm. Okay, so, what, what will it tell us? 
Uh, well, okay, so if you like, we can deduce z. z is chi by beta, so z is 2. Okay, so here, here is the set of exponents for the Edwards Wilkinson model. Let me put them down on the left. E, the EW model. <coughs> and what are they? Chi is a half, beta is quarter, one quarter, and z is two. Now, there is something that I will not get into, but it is an interesting point, and that is that you know we have gone from symmetric exclusion process to Edwards Wilkinson model in, of surface growth. Somewhere we have this quarter. The meaning of the quarter is very clear in the height language. So the RMS displacement of height at a given spot will grow like t to the quarter. What does this t to the quarter mean in the language of particles? The answer is, and I will not try to explain this now, I mean you can read about it somewhere. So it is an interesting point. Think back about your exclusion process. Uh, yeah, I guess this can go. So here you are on your line with your hardcore particles. This is space, let us say this is time. These are evolving. What is their motion like? It is random walks. So, here we are. So, this is random walking around. What is this motion? Also random walk. But this cannot cross that hard co exclusion. It is on a lattice and hard and cannot cross. So, you have a bunch of well lines. Okay, what the quarter turns out to really describe, and there is a way to also show it from this correspondence, is that if you focus on one world line of one particle, and you ask that given that the particle was at point x z, let us just use white, uh, x, let us label the particle by n x n of t minus x n of 0 at time 0 squared average. That grows like, and take a square root, so R n s fluctuation, that actually grows like t to the 1 fourth. This is important to know. I mean, uh, in a system of this sort, hard core exclusion, a single tagged particle RMS displacement grows like t to the quarter and it is the same thing showing up in this height language in some other way. However, you know, I mean, if you ask for density fluctuations at a given t spot in time, uh, you know, so you do, do this evolution and what happens is that these go, let us put in a color so you can, you can go over this. And you put a, ask for your density correlations at a given sp spot. So, here you had a particle there and you just put a line here. Whenever the, that any of these intersect that, there is a particle present. So, if you just look at density correlation functions, you do not care which particle is there. And those, the decay of those is, diff is uh, governed by the normal diffusion equation. Okay? So, in this sort of problem, you must distinguish between tagged particle properties and density, because density does not care which particle there is, there is a density there. But if you care about a single tracer particle. Why, I mean in an experiment, how can you do it? You can put some tag on it. What tag? You can put something, no? I mean, 
fluorescence. Everybody loves fluorescence now. <laughs> okay, fluorescent tag, especially in biology, they love fluorescence. It's, it's always green, by the way. I don't know why. I mean, so green fluorescence. And you see this green particle moving, it will be hemmed in by the others. Is it sensible that it should be hemmed in? Of course it is, because it is hemmed in. You know, so suppose you had not gone through all this nice derivation and all, and if I had asked you just somewhere outside, look, this particle is hemmed in by the others. There are n particles, l sites. There's a mean lattice spacing, I mean, mean spacing between particles. So it's hemmed in. How will the mean squared displacement grow? You might even have said that it will stay finite because it is, you know, after all, there's a space A between the two. You know, so actually it doesn't stay finite, it grows. Just try to understand why. Think. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm making sense, but uh, you know, these were the th thoughts that occurred to me when I first heard it. I found it impossible to believe T to the quarter. I thought it must be finite. It's wrong. That is why it's good to have prejudices. So then when, when your prejudices are overthrown, you remember the answer. Yeah. Yeah. No, they'll remain small, and uh, that is because we are describing, as I said, fluctuations in the steady state. So it's a fact that the steady state does have fluctuations. I mean, if they began to pile up, it would mean for a fact that the state was not steady. I mean, so they don't pile up. I mean, the okay, so, so that, that is one answer. And uh, you know, there's nothing in the dynamics which will really cause pileups. So it, the answer is no, it doesn't pile up. Um, huh? In finite size systems. Also, there doesn't pile up, really. I mean, yeah, I mean, so clearly you have some thought process which uh, uh, says that it should pile up. So, I, so this is the sort of thing I mean. You must have a thought process. You know, the answer might be right or wrong, doesn't matter. But, uh, you know, there's a, so that, that, that's good. Okay, but we will discuss it later. I mean, uh, I'm just saying that it's not piling up. Ah. Think about it. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it. so by the way, there'll be many things that you learn, I mean, that you are told in life. I mean, here's one, you know, and you can't uh, understand it at that moment. That's okay. Just keep it with you in your sort of in your pocket, and keep thinking about it. And one day it will become clear. I mean, <laughs> perhaps not out of the blue, but you'll see something else, and that will resolve it. Anyway, in this case, at lunch, if you ask me, I'll tell you. But but in the meantime, just think about it. I really like you all to think. Yeah. So so I'm glad that at least one person shares my uh, uh, you know incorrect view to start with, that it should be hemmed in and a constant. Okay, but uh, for those of you who didn't follow what I said, do, don't, don't worry, we just uh, march on. All right, so, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Let me now come to a little more general discussion of scaling. A little more general also, more general in the sense that we will, in one shot, do all dimensions for the Edwards Wilkinson, uh, but it will not be at the level of derivation, it will be at the level of, you know, something else. So consider length rescaling. Of your equations or your model. What do I mean? I mean, I have some x. So this is uh, along the lines of renormalization. So we ask what happens under length rescaling to various things. So let's say the length is scaled by a factor b, b bigger than 1. 
So what it means is we define a new variable x prime equal to bx and uh, ask, you know, how will the equations, look, what will the equations, what will be the effective equations in terms of x prime and what, under the scaling, what happens to the other things. So we don't know, so we'll just postulate. So time goes into b to the z time and h goes into b to the uh, chi or 1 over chi, chi. Let's suppose that this happens. So all I'm going to do is substitute these back into the equation and see what the equation becomes. It will get these extra factors of b. So under this, uh, okay, and what about noise? Oh, h. Thank you. And noise, remember, so let, let me write down the answer first. Noise, so by the way, now we're doing it in any dimension, so d, d dimensions, okay? So noise, you remember, was eta, eta is some constant times a d-dimensional delta function in space and a single delta function in time, t minus t prime, x minus x prime, something, yeah? Therefore, eta will pick up, I mean, if you, delta function, as you know, has dimension one over length for each length dimension, so, and one over time for the time one. So that uh, says that eta actually goes into b raised to minus d by 2, minus because it's the property of the delta function, uh, minus, uh, some, can you read this, d over 2 and minus z over 2 times eta. Okay, so this, let, let's see what, what is the effect of the, this sort of scaling. All right, so then you had your equation dh by where, wherever it was. Uh, so let, let me write it again. dh by dt uh, was equal to grad squared h now because it's higher dimensions in principle plus eta. But sort of, yeah. So now I'll just put in the extra factors that you get when you just substitute or rescale uh, everything in this way. So you'll get a fact, for instance, for dh by dt, you'll get something for h and you'll get something from the t. So what, what do you get overall? You get b raised to chi minus z, won't you? Yeah. Here you'll get d into, d, there was a d, b raised to chi minus 2, chi from the h, minus 2 from the grad. And this is b raised to uh, minus d by 2 minus z by 2. Okay, so we multiply across by this one and we're left with dh by dt is capital D times b raised to z minus 2 del squared h plus b raised to minus, okay, so let me get it right, uh, z by 2 minus chi minus d by 2 eta. So suppose we demand, you can question this demand, but let me make the demand, that the equation be unchanged should be what it was. Then, equation, if equation is to remain unchanged, implies z equals 2 and something. Let's write it for chi. So, chi is equal to d minus, oops, yeah, no, z minus e. Just so, so I'm setting this equal to zero. Uh, Z minus d over two. Now, is this demand a reasonable demand or unreasonable demand that I've made? Well, it's actually going to work. So that's a very good argument to say it was a reasonable demand. 
But a priori, we could have said that it's not so unreasonable because this model being a linear model, each momentum mode Q, HK omega, HK decouples. And we're just describing what happens to each one, you know, by rescaling. That, that, that's sort of trivial. They don't actually couple together. The nonlinear term in the KPZ equation actually couples modes. I mean, so you get a K triple prime equal to K1 plus K2 minus K3, that, that sort of thing. You know, so here there's no such thing. Each mode is independent. It's for those of you who have studied critical phenomena, it's like the Gaussian model in statistical mechanics. Each mode is independent and the scaling is immediate. So indeed, this is correct. It is well motivated and correct and uh, very good. Uh, and this is what it is, the answer. So this is the Edwards-Wilkinson answer for all dimensions. But now you ask all dimensions? Yes, as long as chi is positive. So Z is 2 independent of dimension. Why is Z 2? Well, dimensionally, it's dh by dt is something grad squared h. So you look at the h cancels out, t goes like x squared. OK, that, that, that sort of argument. What is the answer for chi? This is chi. So in one dimension, chi is equal to half, as expected. In two dimensions, chi is 0. That 0, actually, if you work out the problem, is not that the interface is flat. The interface has logarithmic fluctuations. So h here and h there, mean squared, grows like log of the separation. But as you know, logarithmic growth in R is slower than any power law. So if you, if you force it to fit to a power law, that power is 0. That is the meaning of that 0. What about above, three, uh, above two dimensions? Let's say in three dimensions. Well, the answer is that this interface does not have a roughness. It's not a rough interface. The integral hr squared, hr minus h0 average, the whole squared, no matter how far I am, is finite. So if you like this, I mean, we don't have a rough interface anymore, and we can't, we cannot therefore talk about, uh, uh, it's, it's all right, because anyway, it's hard, we have a hard time imagining a three-dimensional interface. I mean, you know, some of you who are training in general relativity, of course, are very facile with moving from one dimension to the other, but, you know, it's all right. So, uh, the fact of the matter is, mathematically, there is a, a flat interface, and the, this whole description doesn't, uh, is not required, doesn't work, whatever you want to say. I mean, everything says finite. This, so you see the whole point, right? It's in lower dimensions that you have the interesting things. I mean, powers, cell similarities, scaling, all these happen in lower dimensions, and uh, it's there. Now, I know it's time up. Mm -hmm. All right, I, I think we'd better stop. Uh, what I wanted to do was to tell you about more mappings, bet of, not of the original lattice model, but of the KPZ problem to various other problems. So let me at least tell you what they are. I don't know whether we will have time now. There's only one lecture left tomorrow. So we'll see. We'll have to see what to do. But uh, one mapping is onto the noisy Burgers equation. The Burgers equation is a special case of the Navier-Stokes equation, where the pressure term is set equal to zero. So it describes a very, very highly compressible fluid. And if you have a Burgers equation with the, okay, Burgers equation without vorticity, okay, these are slightly finer points, but uh, with noise, there's an exact mapping of the KPZ to the Burgers equation in all dimensions. In fact, that's a very useful mapping not so much for the Burgers as for KPZ. Because the Burgers equation describes the fluid, the velocity fluctuations in a fluid. Suppose you make a Galilean shift in, 
in that fluid problem. So, you have a field V of x and t, right? And you are describing that. H actually uh, grad H becomes V. So, it is as simple as that. It is a vector V. But now you do a Galilean shift by some fixed V naught. That has a sort of slightly profound effect because, first of all, it shifts x. x will become x minus v t, v naught t. But it also shifts v. So, it is a Galilean shift for that language will have affect not only the underlying space, but the field, namely the v field. Because of that, it has a sort of non-trivial consequence. Assuming that we want Galilean invariance to be a property of your renormalized equation under B scaling, you can actually deduce a constraint on the KPZ exponents, and we'll do that. Uh, the second mapping is of the. Okay, so it's good that uh, you know. Sorry, it's not good, but uh, let me take two more minutes uh, and we'll stop. Uh, uh, the, the other thing we'll try to show tomorrow is that the KPZ problem also describes a quite a different sounding problem, a directed polymer in a random medium. Okay, we'll see what the mapping is and w w what it is. That's as far as mapping goes. But yesterday somebody asked me after class, you know, ASAP is very good and all, but why is so much of a sort of obsession with ASAP and KPZ and all that? And the answer is, uh, you know, for one thing, you know, we have all these mappings, mappings between models and so on. But there's a further thing, and at least two further things. One is that, you know, it defines a universality class. So, if you think about the ASAP, you know, this is a very particular model of interacting particles moving on a ring and we derive this some something for that. But in fact, this scaling and scaling functions describe any interacting particle system in that dimension. So, in a sense that is perfectly well defined at large enough x and t, everything is governed not only by the same exponents, but the same scaling function. Therefore, it has a very broad applicability. The last thing I wanted to say is that recent work, last few years, has made clear that this noise term that we are adding in by hand in the KPZ problem is, uh, you know, very physical actually. But even in systems where there is no noise, but the systems are nonlinear and complicated enough to generate their own noise internally, the KPZ theory actually works. Classical mechanical nonlinear equations are described by the KPZ, I mean correlation functions there. So, this hugely expands the scope of KPZ like uh, phenomena, and uh, so I think it is well motivated, it is well worth your time to learn about KPZ. So, I think we will stop there. Um, I would urge all of you to read, you know, an older paper in 1989 by Medina, Hua, Kardar, and somebody, probably Zhang. I think it's physical review A or E. I don't know. E? Do you know? Anybody know? I don't remember. Okay, I'll, I'll get you the exact reference. 1989. Uh, this is a longish paper which has many of these mappings and you know, many of these things talked about, including to the burgers, including to the polymer, including various issues discussed, including calculations, uh, little more than what we've done. But uh, it's, it's a readable paper. It, it has many sections, at least some of the sections, especially the mappings you should read. Hmm. Yes. Yes. No, well, it has a relation. Uh, with the, is it upper or lower? I mean, w one of the dimensions it does. I mean, is it is this called upper or lower? Upper, upper. I mean, the above, which above which it is sort of standard or trivial. Yeah. Of. No, no. Mean field theory of what? No, of which model? You're saying mean field theory as a whole? 
No, no, there's no such thing. Mean field theory for a particular model will have an upper critical dimension. Let's say for the Ising model, you're absolutely right. The four is the upper critical dimension. But if you look at the tricritical point in Ising-like systems, the upper critical dimension is three. If you look at uh, other problems of this sort, the upper critical dimension is uh, whatever it is. You have to find out. So for this class of problems, it is two. I mean, this class means without the nonlinearity. Now, with nonlinearity, I don't know the answer. Uh, KPZ. Uh, I, I guess uh, when the see KPZ, I think the situation. Uh, see, you can do two things. In fact, I'll do them next time. One is you can be at the Edwards-Wilkinson fixed point, and you can ask for the relevance of K uh, of the KPZ term. Right. That actually switches in two below two dimensions and above. Yeah. But but what people suspect, I guess is that in that case, uh, so I mean, if I'm right, I, I, I hope uh, this is correct. Just confirm. So let's say in one dimension, for instance, uh, you have your Edwards-Wilkinson fixed point. By the way, class is over. You all can go. I mean, do, 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 you don't have to wait. Uh, 